ask the congregation to arise. We are gathered here with the Kuiper family to say goodbye to a dear husband, father, brother, friend, Clarence Kuiper. This is a sacred moment. It's sacred because we want to honor the life. Clarence was a gift of God to us for a time and a season. It's also sacred because at these moments we gather around each other and encourage and hold each other up and strengthen each other. Most of all, it's a sacred time because God is here. He is with us right now. So dearly beloved, as we gather, know that our help, our strength is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and earth. Let us set the tone for that by reminding ourselves of how great our God is. We'll sing, How Great Thou Art. It'll be on the screens, but also on the 483 in the gray books. How Great Thou Art. We'll sing stanzas one and four. be seated. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 16, one of the, one of the last passages that I was able to read with Clary, where the psalmist David says, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body will also rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. What confidence a believer can have that these words are not just for David in his time, but for all God's people at all times. Jesus reaffirmed this when he himself stood 
at the graveside of a loved one, a dear friend, Lazarus, and he was talking to Martha, and he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever believes and lives in me will never die. And then he asked that question that rings out uh, through that graveyard and through the corridors of time to our own heart. Do you believe this? And then from 1 Thessalonians, Paul proclaims his confidence. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, gathered around your throne in glory is that great company of all those who, by your grace, have kept the faith, finished their race, and now rest from their labor. We give you praise and thanks that you have now received Clary into your presence. Help us who are here today believe that which we cannot see. And to place our trust in Christ who has prepared a place for all his children. And lead us to that place, our true eternal home, in your time. Until then, strengthen us for the journey that lies ahead. May we take the next step through this valley of shadows with the full assurance that you are with us even now. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
the confidence that we have as believers is that our life belongs to Jesus Christ. That is stated in the first catechism question and answer number one. You should find an insert in your bulletins. It will also be on the screen. I'll ask the question, and then if we together as a family of believers can join our voices in the answer. Congregation of Jesus Christ, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all of my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. A moment in time. You look at the pictures and you see a little boy, Clary, Clarence. And then you see snapshots of him growing up, family members around him. You see a beautiful picture of a wedding. You see children that are born and that grow. There's a lot more to Clary's story. He was a real person with a real story. And he lived his life, worked, went to church, had a family, went on vacation, played golf, loved Scrabble, so many different aspects to this man who we honor today. It's always good to see him through the eyes of those who know him best and, um, his son, Bill, uh, will say a few words at this time. He may, he may or may not, I don't know. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> On behalf of my sisters, Sandy, Susan and Jane and our families and on behalf of Nancy and her family we'd like to thank you so very much for being here to remember Clarence 85 years Wow um, it seems like a long time but yet it's just it's just a breath you know it's just it's, it's such a fleeting moment and we just need to remember dad we're here to remember his life not dwell on his death Yes, for all hope, heartbroken at losing a sweet, caring, and special man. But you're all here today because my dad was in some way a part of your life and had an effect on it. It may have been many years ago, or it may have been just a few weeks ago. But I know dad had an impact, a positive impact, on most every life that he has touched. As I look around the sanctuary, I have memories. I, I see flashes of my dad with, with each one of you that I, that I know, that I know well, whether it's campouts, family get-togethers. As I was sitting here thinking, um, you know, this being involved in the school, I remember in, 19, I, think, I believe it was 78, uh, this, this uh, um, blizzard that came through and we had to shovel off the roof of the school so that it wouldn't cave in. And I remember so many of you being there as part of that too. There's so many memories. As I see you people here, it's, it's just wonderful to have you here. I just went off script. Um, <laughs> I know each of you has a unique memory of, of Dad, and that's, that's what I want to say today, is, is you've got to take these memories of these people that we lose 
and just hold on to them because that's how they stay. That's how they stay alive in our lives. And we, need, we just need to, everyone, just remember dad in a special way how he has affected your life and, and, and that's all I'm asking right now. Those memories that we have stay in our hearts and even though he's no longer with us physically, he, with, he is with his father in heaven. Dad was a solid member of this church his entire life. He was on council as a deacon or an elder nine times. He was a quiet leader. I've talked to a few people in the last few days. He was a quiet leader. He led by example. He was not, um, he was not loud. He was very humble. But people would listen to him. And he had, you know, he had good things to say. And I, he was such a great role model that way. I, you know, he, he would always think before he spoke. And that's... That's the way I've always tried to, to be as well. Um, he worked at Insincorator for 42 years. Um, people don't live, the, people don't work that long in a company anymore. It's just, that's, that's the way it was. That was that generation. He, 42 years. He started out driving trucks and working his way into the data processing department. And then he went on as the office manager until he retired. Um, he was well liked and respected by his fellow employees and um, he kept those relationships for years. It's just, we had people from Insincorator that worked with him for almost all that 42 years, still remembering dad, and it was great to see them there last night. Um, he loved his family, <clears throat> and he seemed happiest when we were all together. Um, he, ne he was never the center of attention, and he really didn't like the attention, um, but he did need attention the last few years, and he, and he didn't like that. He didn't like to to ask for help, you know, he was very proud, but he just, he didn't, he didn't want to be the center of attention, you know, he just liked to sit back and, and, and be with us. He would, when our family was around, um, he would just sit back and take it all in. All of us kids and grandkids live quite a distance from each other, we don't get together that often, but when we do get together, it's like we, we pick up right where we left off, and we giggle and snort and have all kinds of fun, and Dad would just sit back and enjoy it, and you could just see that it was, it was just the best thing for him. <clears throat> he loved that, and you could see on those rare occasions when we were together um, that he really enjoyed it. Well, Dad, we're all together now, and we all want you to know you are loved, you will be missed, and will never be forgotten. I also want to take this opportunity to um, publicly thank Nancy for loving our dad, for being a part of his life for the last 20 years and caring for him. Uh, I know you didn't see it as a burden these last few years that you loved him. We know you did. And we appreciate everything you've done for dad. And we will never forget that either. I have two more things. I'm going to read a passage, and I'm going to ask a favor. First, Romans 8, 26 through 30. Uh, my brother-in-law, Pete, read this the night that Dad passed away, and I, I wanted to repeat it for everybody here. <clears throat> in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified, and our Father is now glorified. Now the favor. A um, little over 22 years ago, I stood up here <laughs> at my mother's funeral, <clears throat> and I asked everybody at that time to, in the next days, weeks, I had do a random act of kindness. And I hope in the last 22 years, Somebody said that you've all done your first, your first one. If you haven't, we're going to have to talk. <laughs> but
But I'm asking you, uh, in the next day or two, in the weeks ahead, do a random act of kindness and think about my dad when you do it. And remember him that way. Thank you all again for being here. I want to read a couple of words. Have that moment of panic where I buried the paper. It's from Kevin. It, we, everybody has a story. Um, that's, that's part of the journey of our life. Life happens. Kevin said, I lost my father at 23, and it was so difficult grieving while watching my mom get through the pain of being alone. She waited for God's plan for her next chapter in life. I never worried about mom when she married Clary. He was a sweet, unassuming, kind, and loving man. He had a wit that would sneak up on you, and we always shared laughs together. It was easy to see that they enjoyed each other and loved each other. Mom was caring, and Clary deserved every bit of it. I think when children get older, they wish for happiness for their parents and strong relationships to get them through the tough times of failing health. I know that my dad would be thankful for Clary and his love for my mom. They showed us an example of how to love and care for each other in their marriage. It's difficult to measure yourself as a husband and a father when Clary was the example. We love you, Clary. Thank you, Kevin. That was beautifully written. The legacy of faith is the, probably the proudest thing that... Uh, Clary would say that he has left behind for the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And I would like to invite the grandchildren to come forward at this time and as a tribute to their great-grandfather to sing a timeless song of faith, Jesus Loves Me. Well done. Let's all join our voices in song in singing, There is a Redeemer.
As we prepare to open up the word, let us go in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, living bread of life, light of the world, where else can we go but to you? You alone can turn the darkness of death into the brightness of morning light. In the stillness of these moments, speak to us of eternal things so that hearing the promises of Scripture, we may have hope and be lifted up above the darkness and distress into the light and peace of your presence through Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. I'm going to be looking at Psalm 63. There are so many good texts that uh, we were looking at, and uh, Clary uh, loved the Word of God. He engaged in it weekly as he attended church, and then small group Bible studies, and society meetings, and council meetings, the Word of God was central. And he picked a beautiful, beautiful psalm, and we have not enough time to really dig into it, but hear the Word of God from someone who is walking in the wilderness. Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will praise you. I will glorify you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glorify him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God's love is indeed better than life. David, who wrote this psalm, is in the desert again. He's running for his life again. The first time, it was because his best friend's father was trying to kill him to keep him from becoming the next king. This time, his own son, his flesh and blood, is trying to kill him because he wants the throne from him. Now, if you know the story of David, and I don't know how familiar you are with it, but 1 Samuel is a great read, which details the chronicle of David's rise and his fall and his rise again to become the king that exemplifies Jesus. But if you know the story of David, you might say he is here in this desert because he deserved it. If he hadn't have gone for a walk on that fateful night on the roof of his palace years ago, if he hadn't have seen a woman bathing, if he hadn't have uh, slept with her, if he hadn't have conceived that child, if he hadn't have tried to cover it up, and then if he hadn't have had the consequences, you see where I'm saying? He deserved this. He 
then almost disqualified himself as a father. If only, if only, then he may never have been in this desert running for his life. But here he is. Life happens. And he finds himself here partly because of his sin, but partly through the choices that others made. And where does he turn? Where does he find comfort? Where does he find hope and direction for his life? In the Bible, the wilderness is a metaphor. It is a place of want. It is a place of need. It is a place that could kill you. It is a place that you need God to get you through. You need super intervention, supernatural intervention. And David knew this. And he knew where to turn. In the chill of his darkest hour, he was saved from despair because he knew that he had a father who would hear his prayer. He knew a love that was so much better than life itself. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David knew that he belonged to his God. It's what we had confessed earlier in the catechism. My only comfort in life and in death is that I belong in body and soul. He knew a love that was better than life itself. A love that satisfied his deepest thirst. A love that superseded even his ascension to the throne with all of the perks of being a king. He knew that there was something better than even holding the power in the land. And that knowledge put a song in his mouth. And in the end, he was not forgotten. In the end, he was saved from deep despair. In the end, he walked where his shepherd led and stayed very close to the sound of his voice. Clary knew the desert well. The last few years of his life was a wilderness experience, to say the least. He struggled for life. And he prayed for health. And he longed for that day when he could come back and worship with God's people. He said, you, you look good on TV, Pastor, but I would rather see you live. <laughs> he knew the desert well. And we prayed a lot and we believed that in an instant, God could heal him. And we're a little bit shocked when we're anticipating, on the one hand, his transition to a, a care center that, that would help him heal and get strong enough, and his goal was always to be home, to be home. That's where he wanted to be. So the sudden turn in his prognosis was hard news to swallow, we prayed him through the pains. We prayed him through the up and downs, through the hopeful moments, to the, the slow and steady decline of his health. And when we're anticipating the next step on his journey, then suddenly we had to pivot. And in a, in a beautiful moment, to hear Clary saying goodbye or to hear the voices on the other end of the phone saying, I love you, Dad. I love you, brother. To me, sort of summarized, you know, the essence of Clary's faith. He knew a love that was better than life. The stinger of death has embedded itself in our life again. 
And we know that God answered our prayers not in the way that we had hoped for, but in a way that God knew was best. It it was Tim Keller who pointed out that sometimes our Heavenly Father gives us an answer. He gives us what we would have asked for if we could have seen life from his perspective. If we knew everything that God knew, then he would give us that answer to our prayers. In other words, he redirects our prayers, giving us what is best. We can look back and say, like David, Clary had his if-only moments. If only I had made a few better choices as a young person. If only I would have been a better father, a better husband, a better churchman. If only. We all have those kind of regrets. But Clary didn't go there. I think he knew that this sickness was going to end in his home going. He said that. And I also know that he was okay with it. Not that he didn't love life. Not that he wouldn't want to be here in person to see his wonderful family get together. But he was okay with it. He knew that there was something better in store for him. He never lived his life looking in the rearview mirror. Just as David didn't do it, he didn't also. He knew that the love of God was better than life. Knowing that love satisfied his deepest thirst, it put a song in his mouth, maybe a song that sounded a little bit like a Gaither tune, I don't know. On the darkest nights when He couldn't sleep when his condition woke him up often at night. He knew he had a refuge in God and that he was safe from all harm. In God's perfect time, I would say May 3, 1936, in the middle of a great depression, God's purposes for his life began. He was born. For those of you who know, here's an interesting fact. That was the same day that Joe DiMaggio had his debut in Major League Baseball. Random fact, I just found that when I logged the date. But his parents, William and Ann, believed the promise of God. And they brought little Clarence forward. And in the presence of God and all the witnesses, they said, Lord, you made promises to us that if we would be your people, that you would save us. And and he was baptized as a symbol of their belief in the promises of God. On May 9, at the age of 18, he professed his faith. He claimed what his parents had hoped for and promised when they brought him there, that we're going to raise him to know and love Jesus Christ. And he set up, stood up tall in front of his congregation and said, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And God led him through the deserts of his life, through the ups and downs. In the joys, he sang songs of praise. And in his sorrows, there may have been a minor key in his lament. Marriage to Evelyn, the birth of Sandy, Susan, Jane, and Bill filled his heart with so much joy. You could feel the pride in his fatherly heart, even as his, this, to this day when he talks about his children. And I'm sure that the birth of his grandchildren was even better. He didn't have to really raise them. He just had to spoil them. The comfort and companionship of his marriage to Nancy and the fellowship that he had with the people of God and his years of school at Lutheran or at RCS and then Lutheran High and Calvin gave him the knowledge of God and helped him to understand the world a little bit better. 
and his mundane, ordinary, everyday life and rhythm of life of working at Insincorator was part of God's plan for his life. He felt the pain of losing his parents, his wife, his brother. Those were part of the bitter pill that he had to swallow. But you know, suffering does one of two things. It will either make you a more bitter person. Why, God, do you let this happen in my life? Why can't uh, you answer some of my prayers the way I want? Or it has the opposite effect. It draws you closer to God, like David in this barren wilderness running for his life. Haven't I done enough for you, God? Haven't I said sorry enough and uh, now my son is trying to kill me? No, David didn't go there. He knew a love that was better than life. There is... A reality, and I don't know how best to, to paint the picture. I'm going to try because really this life isn't what it's all about. I wonder if one of the great grandchildren wants to help me out with this. I promise I won't make you do a lot, but I just want to sort of picture what it is like. This life, this desert that we live the pain and the joys and the sorrows that we experience as compared to what Clary is experiencing now. Any giver, I'll, I'll give you a candy <laughs> if you come and help me. It, it won't be hard. Just come right up here. Yes. Because we feel, we live in life moment by moment, right? And, and we, we feel like, oh, some nights last forever. What I'd like you to do is to take this string and just start walking out. Just go all the way to the end. Just walk and hold that tight. There we go. Time. I'm trying to picture eternity. And that's what gives me both hope. You can just drop it right there. Thank you. So this is just symbolic. Just imagine this string goes on forever. Clary lived to be 84, 5. He's, his birthday's coming up really soon. Wow. So his 85 years, if we could picture it in eternity, is this much on the string. And that's what consumes so much of our time and energy and effort. I think that Clary realized as a young man, when he stood up at age 18 and said, I love Jesus, I don't think he knew the full implication. He was just doing what every good church-going boy does. He makes profession of his faith in Jesus Christ. But he lived his life. And it became more apparent to him that as much as he dearly loves his family and children, this is only a little blip of who he really is and where he will really spend eternity. If you find yourself in a desert today, I hope that this picture sticks in your mind. No matter what pain and suffering you may have experienced, no matter what bitter choices you've made that maybe hold you down, maybe even the joys that you have, which are so very temporary, it's not going to matter. The important thing is, where are you going to spend eternity? David knew his God. He was my God. We own each other. We love each other. And my father has given me something that is so much better than this life. Clary is in a better place. And I'm looking forward to the day that I can join him. And I hope you are too. And if you feel like you're not, please talk to me or someone. Grieving, it's such a a hard thing to, to wrestle with, but it's so good that we wrestle with it, and, and you don't have to wrestle with it all alone. If you 
are surrounded by a community of faith, lean into that, talk to each other, share the memories, celebrate life. A year from now, it's not going to be over. You're going to continue to share memories and have moments of tears. And it's okay. And as we give each other the strength and encouragement that we need, that's where we find hope. That's where that we make the most of that little piece of time that we have together. All good things in this world come to an end. Death has no regard for our preferred timeline. The moment we take our first breath, the clock begins to tick. And there's that day coming. And please know that the real life is not here and now. It is beyond. So to Nancy and the Kuiper family, so sorry for your loss. We do just get a glimpse of that pain and we remember losses we have experienced in our life. As a wife, as a child, as a grandchild, as a great-grandchild, you are experiencing profound loss. And the only person in the whole mix that is not experiencing loss is Clary. He's a Christian. His death is his gain. It's loss for us, but gain for him. Amen. Living an eternal God, generations come and generations pass away before your presence. From age to age, people have sought you in this dry and weary land where there is nothing that ultimately satisfies. Our mothers and fathers, too, have walked their, their pilgrimage in the light of your guidance, protection, and grace. Now to us, their children, we pray that you will be a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day as we make our way through this desert land. When we hunger and thirst, satisfy our souls with the richest of food and the quenching drink of your living water where we sing in a minor key because of sufferings and hardship and losses of this life, put instead a song of praise in our mouth, a song that acknowledges that your love is indeed better than life. And when darkness surrounds us, help us to still carry a tune in the shelter of your wings. O oh God, our God, we earnestly seek you. Thank you for Clary. As a gift of your grace, he entered in and so deeply enriched our lives. Thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a fellow traveler on this earthly journey. We thank you for all in him that was good and kind and faithful. We especially thank you for the tremendous love that he had for people, for his uh, sense of humor, that, that dry wit that he had about him. We thank you for his love for music, for his work at the IT, at uh, Insincorator, for giving him a love for golfing, walking, traveling, Scrabble, for reading, for being in touch with what's happening on the political scene, even for being a Nebraska fan. Lord, in life he was humble and caring. Thank you so much for his life. He will be deeply missed by all of us. Now he has joined that great cloud of witnesses and we remember your mercies to Clary, for as good as we make him out to be, we know that like the rest of us, he needed your forgiveness and your grace. 
Now may he hear your commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Jesus, you open the gates of eternal life to your servants. Now help us who remain to comfort one another, to strengthen one another and to rejoice with one another and to weep with one another until that day we will all meet again in the new heaven and the new earth. And now, as we take the next step on this journey and eat some food and drink, and share stories, have conversation. We pray your richest blessing on the food that you provide for us. Thank you for the hands that have prepared it. And we pray that as we eat, we may have strength physically to deal with the emotional challenges that we face in the days ahead and spiritually, too, that you will give us strength. Lord, hear our prayers, for we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We landed on the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and uh, let us sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We will rise to sing this song. would like to invite the, uh, those in attendance here to stay for lunch. I don't know if you noticed, but I snuck a prayer in there at the end, blessing the food, so I think we'll just go right in and uh, have, as we leave, then just go right in line and uh, grab your food. At 1.30, there will be a committal service at Westlawn Park. If you are driving there, there will not be a funeral procession per se. You will just go there and meet at 1.30. Just come into the entrance off of 90 and uh, Highway 20. In the corner there, you'll see this car is starting to line up. So just in case you are wondering how that works. And you may want to uh, give yourself about uh, 15, 20 minutes to get there. So... Anyway, as we go now, go in the strength and the power of God. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And may the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
remain with you now and forever. Amen. I'm going to sing a song of doxology as we're leaving, and that's uh, because he lives. We'll sing all the stanzas.